Hello strategy gaming enthusiasts, my name is Alzbo HD. In today's challenge video, we are Gandhi put the Bharat in Britain and seek to colonize the British Isles as India. But we won't be playing as just any nation. We will try harder and attempt this challenge by starting as Porbandar, the birthplace of Gandhi. This purple peripheral polity is second to none, and by far one of the weakest and poorest one province miners within the subcontinent, making it a perfect choice for a karmic comeuppance. J Balaki, it's time to decolonize our way into Europe and start our campaign. In 1444, Poor Bondar starts as a 5 development OPM with generic Gujarati regional ideas. If we're Gandhi do something about this terrible start, we'll have to move fast to consolidate a power base. Our first order of business will be to build up a peaceful mass of Indian infantry and max out our meager force limit. The neighboring nations of Junarg and Palatana make for a tasty target, and, after several months, are promptly liberated, cored, and annexed into the Raj. But there is a problem. Neighboring Gujarat is huge and completely casts away any possibility of expansion within the vicinity. We'll have to break the rulebook and attack the Sinhalese and Tamil kings. After all, our only possible path of expansion will be through Kandy and Sri Lanka, and in 1451, the decision is made to best CB the Buddhist island and curry out an island invasion. Outnumbered 6-8, to eight, the Tamil and Sinhalese of Sri Lanka were pounded by Porbandar's advances, and were subsequently incorporated into the Porbandaran polity. Given the ambitions of our rising Raj, the sovereign chief Sanji moved swiftly to secure an alliance with Bahamanas, a key state that would prove pivotal to Porbandar's rise to power. Upon promising Bahamanas territorial spoils of war, Porbandar launched a two-front invasion of Gujarat that relied heavily on their Maharashtran allies to the east. Thousands of men on both sides were slain and reincarnated over the next three years, though ultimately the spacious sultanate was cowed under the strength of Sanji's advances. Peace was proclaimed, land was anointed, and Porbandar's continental holdings doubled in size. Further to the south, Kerala and the Maldives were peacefully liberated, while the capital of Porbandar reached enough development to kick off a Raja renaissance within the subcontinent. In time, our purple polity gobbled up Gujarat and force vassalized the rump state of Mawar, backstabbed Baha Manas, and shifted its sites to the south, where Porbandi's settlers embarked on the colonization of Madagascar. With exploration and administrative ideas taken, the rightful Raj was well equipped to expand by both land and sea, and by the end of the 1400s had expanded to roughly 40 times the size of its meager borders five decades earlier. The vassal state of Mawar was properly fed the vegetarian remnants of Gujarat and Dundar, while Kilwanese mercenaries to the south marauded across Madagascar, ceding vast swaths of land to our Hindu homeland. At the dawn of the 16th century, Poor Bandar entered into the pantheon of global hegemons and was proclaimed the seventh greatest world power in 1507. The soldiers of Shiva were relentless in their peaceful liberations of the rivaling Rajas of Africa and Asia, and India's first flagship, the Jabalaki, sailed out in honor of our decorous deity. By 1526, only the two states of Delhi and Vijayanagar threatened our ardent ambitions. But before putting the delete in Delhi, the peaceful Porbandis marched southwards, slaying the soldiers of Vijayanagar in the closest to date approximation of equally marched armies. In spite of their slight numerical advantage, the Yellow Lords of Yoga were yeeted from the mortal plane, and Porbandar promptly proclaimed the liberation of Tamil Nadu and released their vassal of Madurai. Further to the west, the voyages of the sea ship Enterprise concurrently made landfall in South Africa, St. Helena, and the coast of a mystery continent shrouded in forests of rain. In the interim, back in India, our Mewanar's vassal was integrated, colonialism was established as an institution, and Rajasthani was proclaimed the new culture of a rapidly rising realm. But before the Rajputs could be reunified, the Karma police of Porbandar proudly reappropriated the peripheral heartlands of the Delhi Sultanate. The Vedas had also predicted the fall of the malevolent Maharashtran Marathas to the south, and, in between wars, Bahamanas was vassalized and subsequently fed cores of Vada Pav. Concurrent with the rise of the rightful Raj in South Asia, Porbandar extended peaceful pleasantries with the natives of the New World, benevolently trading and converting them in the ways of Hinduism. Shiv Kadi, the first colonial nation of Porbandar, was thus proclaimed in 1559 in honor of Shiva, Jay Balaki. 
Further gains were made to the west of this nascent realm, and a mere seven years later, the second colonial nation of Kubera Bahadan, or the Mountains of the God of Wealth, were founded in peaceful partnership with the indigenous Indians of the land. But Porbandar itself was nearing the limits of its previous potential, and changes, outside of cyclically conquering Delhi, necessitated a change in direction. In an effort to maximize their potential, the politicians of Porbandar made a deal with the devil and formed an alliance with the Raja of the distant realm of the Angle lands. These pale and proud people hailed from a distant land of relentless rain and spiceless sustenance. And upon contact, the Porbandis realized that the die had been cast and that nothing would ever remain the same. While the Pujaris of the realm remained hostile to such an unorthodox alliance, the Raja realized that the ways of the West and modernization was the only way forward. In August of 1569, this wave of modernization reincarnated Porbandar into Rajputana, ushering in the second era of our realm's rise to power. The newly anointed Raja of Rajputana traded in his generic national ideas for far more than store credit, and now possessed the core cost reductions and discipline modifiers needed to vanquish Vijayanagar once and for all. Our Brahmin boys in Baha Manas were eager to accept our offerings, as the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. Further afield, the rightful Raj was intent on uniting the Western Indies, and set about liberating the peoples of southern and northern Nubaratia. To this effect, Lord Ganesha was awarded the third colony of Rajputana in 1567, and, in the successive years, Brahmaputra, or son of Brahma, was forged on the ashes of Mayan heresy. Indeed, Rajputana was rapidly ascending the rungs of global hegemony, and was at the forefront of the liberation of both the West and East Indies. But despite the advances into the heart of Hindustan, a lack of absolutist rule meant that gains would remain meager until the advent of the 17th century. Disregarding this latent limitation, Delhi was itself deleted in 1592, and at last the capital of the subcontinent reverted to the rightful rule of the Hindu Raj. Following in the footsteps of their foreign friends in Britain, the Rajas of the Rajput swiftly set about the foundation of New Bijapur, peacefully partitioned the Congo, and contiguously connected the Rajas of the West Indies. In a somewhat surprising and entirely unexpected turn of events, the perfidious Protestants of Albion betrayed our rightful Raj and directly intervened in our benevolent campaigns along the northern continent. Peace was never an option. Rajputana was forced to concede with modest gains amid their semi-annual annexation of Vijayanagar and focus their forces on the foreign front lines. But despite the desires of our Desi defiance, the Raj was outgunned and outmatched against Britain and was forced to concede a shameful white peace at the turn of the 17th century. Undeterred from this betrayal, Rajputana pushed forward into the frigid Northlands, annexing Cree and the deviant Dutch holdings to establish new Porbandar in 1612. In between these non-violent unifications of Western Indian lands, more and more of Eastern Indian lands were reunified and reunited into the rising Raj. But revenge is a dish best served cold, and in 1619, the guns of Ganashji declared war on British Columbia in an attempt to liberate the West Indies from British Indies. This marked the first offensive war against Britain, though it was far from being the last. Anglo colonies were burned to the ground, and the indigenous populations were liberated by force, allowing Rajputana to grow Ganashji by a magnitude of two. Meanwhile in Africa, the Raja's regent declared a decolonization war against Spain, with the ultimate goal of emancipating South Africa and Canada from Iberian imposition. War was waged across the northern and southern hemispheres, but eventually Spain ceded South Africa and parts of Canada and Mexico to our righteous Raj. And speaking of Spain, pain was further inflicted on the green rectangle of Portugal, who sought to yoga and Goa. By this point in time, Rajputana's fleet was grand enough to threaten the North Atlantic, allowing Indian soldiers to disembark and occupy the capital of Lisbon. Goa was thus liberated, along with substantial portions of the New World, including the entirety of Portuguese Louisiana, which is today of course known as New Tanjore. Back in our Hindu homeland, Bahamanas' integration resulted in the direct administration of new states, who were in turn oppressively centralized to generate absolutism. In the intervening years, Britain was beaten back from British Columbia, resulting in gains for Ganeshji, while within the subcontinent, Orissa and their Ming allies were routed in the Bay of Bengal. 
This eastward expansion earned Rajputana the key provinces of Kotak and Palaputra, and granted the Raja the stability needed to form an Indian Empire. In 1664, Desi destiny forever changed with the foundation of Bharat and a new beginning for our subcontinental superpower. But success breeds jealousy, and Spain was quick to form a coalition of oppressed OPMs in an attempt to halt our global assault. But it was too little too late, and nothing could stop our irate Indians from fulfilling their God's given goal. Britain must bend the knee for their crimes in North Baratia, and were thus invaded on the coasts of Africa in 1649. But rather than fight a multi-front war, the benevolent Baratis offered up portions of their Tunisian and Austrian allies, allowing them to concentrate on Britain and Indian internal affairs. Under the guidance of Admiral Vikramaditya, British boats were smote by the Jebalaki, allowing Imperial infantry to disembark in Ireland. Further afield, the Firelands, or Ak Kagola, were colonized in preparation for the reception of British nationals, while the Bay of Bengal bent the knee to their South Asian saviors. The eve of victory in Britain was nearly upon our nation, and, after Indian troops reappropriated London, Albion was eager to curry out concessions. From henceforth, Ireland was a province of Imperial India, and England was entirely expelled from southern New Baratia. At this point, India's peaceful proliferation in both hemispheres was infuriating their neighbors, and thus the decision to ally China came quickly in anticipation of further coalitions. In quick succession, Vijayanagar was viciously vanquished, Dang was destroyed, and Orissa was obliterated. Further anticipating a second Bharati invasion of Britain, the Imperial Command recruited mercenaries of the Irish Republican Army, who would later form the vanguard of the liberation of Ireland. By 1670, the Second Battle for Britain was at hand, and this time Bharat broke and routed the Anglos in the fields of Ayr. The golden century of Bharat beckoned forth, and the Brits were beaten out of their Scottish strongholds. Hordes of Hindus descended upon Liverpool and Hull, while Irish Catholic mercenaries annihilated British resistance in London. By 1674, it was all over, and India imposed rule over Wales, Scotland, and the Isles of Manipur. This liberation of historically Indian land was yet again contested by Spain and her gang, who traded peace for a pittance of political concessions from our reliable allies in Tunisia. Meanwhile, on the home front, our superpowers subjugated and liberated thousands of kilometers of land from any Indian state that stubbornly refused to bend the knee to Bharati decree. By 1689, India was yet again at the gates of Westminster, begging the question of how many wars it would take to finally put the Bharat into Britain. The Imperial Army and their Indian-Irish allies poached Redcoat resistance and pushed the British back from whence they came. Across the Channel, their Dutch allies were summarily invaded and occupied, leading to the liberation of Panama and the decolonization of Dutch coastal colonies. In a space of just four years, Great Britain was anything but great, and was thus relieved of her Scottish and Northumbrian possessions. Norway tried to say no to this development, but was relieved of her sovereignty, proudly joining her rightful Raj in membership of the strongest superpower on Earth. But these encounters in Europe were not limited to only the Burati Isles. In fact, India lusted after Floride and the colonies of the Guinoi, forcing the empire to send out Punjabi partisans to Paris. For the first time in European history, France held back against the Hindu hordes of our imperial invasion forces. Their discipline and morale was unmatched across the continent, and required us to hire a hundred thousand mercenaries to even attempt at maintaining our position along the periphery of Paris. That being said, the friends of France were not as fierce, and Iceland was annexed in 1699, while the other co-belligerents eventually dropped for a white peace. In 1702, after years of dying of attrition on the streets of Paris, a final peace was reached whereby half of Louisiane and fragments of Floride were conceded to our colonial subjects, but the war was far from over. As can be expected with French former possessions, the protesting propensities of their former liege resulted in glaive and strikes throughout Louisiana. French rebels battled for control of New Tanjore, while our guilds threatened to unionize, leaving us little option but to punish perfidious Albion. 
In January of 1709, it was finally time to put the Barat back into Britain. By this point in time, the United Kingdom was anything but united, and fielded a meager 40,000 men to defend against the nearly 200,000 Imperial infantry of the Indian Empire. Irish Indian mercenaries roasted the roast beefs until they were inevitably massaged in the Downs of Devon. With London promptly liberated, the boats of Barat ferried our forces into the fields of Flanders, culminating in the occupation of Dutch Den Haag. In exchange for rupees, the Netherlands was spared, but the English ally of Austria posed a problem. Rather than curry out an invasion to hobble the Habsburgs, the Raja opted to push for an early peace, and annexed more of the Midlands while forcing England to break their alliance with Austria. Barat will be back, and next time England would be erased from Europe. After all, what do they Gandhi do about that? In the interceding years, Bharat subjugated slices of Southeast Asia, and was soon back to blows with the Big Blue Blob. Hundreds of thousands of Irish mercenaries perished in the fields of Brittany and beyond, but ultimately, Porbandar prevailed and stripped France of all of her colonial holdings. Rather than risk the mass protests and strikes of yore, the Raja then partitioned these Frenchmen into a peaceful preservation. Further to the east, revolutions across Russia erupted in Moscow and began a spread of radical revolutionary ideas across the realm. Threatened by unloyal subjects manipulated by Moscow and contained by a Castilian coalition of a hundred nations, India instead opted to bide her time and break Britain once and for all. In 1738, it was time to Brexit the British and banish them from the so-called British Isles. I'd like to say that the final battle for Britain was fought bravely, but that's simply not true. Their forces were routed and reduced to none, their boats were broken, and London was calling for peace and Indian liberation. In 1740, the English king was spiced and diced to thunderous applause, and England was no more. At long last, the Bharati Isles belonged to India, and Hinduism and our Rajasthani culture were free to spread instead. The founding of New Mumbai in 1742 marked a turning point in Hindu's history, and rule Bharatiya now ruled the waves. At the dawn of the mid-18th century, India is invincible and controls the plurality of South Asia, coastal Africa, North and South America, and the Bharati Islands, formerly known as Britain. Although under the dynastic control of the legendary Manchurian Isengoryo family, the Bharati sovereign Krishna I rules over a decidedly Hindu empire and has transformed the religion into the second most popular faith in the world. In terms of culture, the Rajasthani Raj has peacefully permeated all continents of the world and can be found in Asia, Oceania, Africa, the Americas, and even in Europe, where the Bharati Isles are quickly being colonized by South Asian settlers who have founded the city and new trade capital of New Mumbai on the ruins of London. There does, however, exist large amounts of cultural border gore throughout the Americas, reflecting a legacy of the subjugation of European powers at the hands of the karmic police of the Bharati Raj. In time, all foreign colonies will be liberated and cast away from their European oppressors. Barat boasts the second largest military in the world, second only to Spain, but does possess the largest naval fleet, commanding control of world trade and facilitating the governance of the transcontinental superpower. And speaking of power, Barat is the undisputed global hegemon, though a super Spain at the head of a million-man coalition has resulted in the emergence of a Cold War. This is further exacerbated by unchecked revolutionary fervor seeping from Moscow, itself the birthplace of proletarian revolution and a springboard of radicalism that has already decapitated and converted the monarchs of Europe into revolutionary republics. In 1742, these deeply dystopian ideas descend upon South Asia like the Russian tourists of yore, and in time, a decision will have to be made to either crush our former northern allies or for our Raja to succumb to a Gujarati guillotine. If you are interested in that sort of thing, I'd also recommend checking out my Raiding the World with Anarchists challenge video, which is in a card at the top right of your screen. Before ending the video, I'd like to thank you for watching this far and supporting the algorithm. 
If you like EU4 and want more strategy gaming content, I humbly request that you usurp the like button and claim the subscription box. On this channel you can find a variety of other challenge videos, and with the release of Leviathan and the new EU4 update, more Europa Universalis content is on the way next week. I hope you all have a fantastic day, and I'll see you in the next video. It's time now to roll the credits.